afternoon and uh, welcome to our Ask Me Anything live session hosted by Aaron Rothbard. Uh, thank you so much for joining us today. My name is Esperance Chesoli and I'm the team lead of Iron Growth Pad Department at Interregion Economic Network. This is a department that is keen on promoting uh, enterprise development in the whole East African region. I'm glad to be joined by our guest speaker, who is uh, an expert in the topic of eating healthy with indigenous foods. She is a distinguished scientist that has conducted pioneering research in African indigenous vegetables, in brackets AIVs. Her work has had a tre tremendous impact on the utilization of indigenous vegetables in Africa, and it has led to her receipt of numerous awards, including presidential, Africa Union Awards, and the Edinburgh Medal. Her work has inspired consumers, producers, students, young researchers, and influenced governments to consider the importance of indigenous foods for nutrition, health, and income generation. Her passion, coupled with her careful scientific multidisciplinary research, have repositioned indigenous vegetables from a poor man's crop to internationally recognized super vegetables. She holds a bachelor in agriculture, masters in agronomy, and a PhD in vegetal, vegetable crop physiology and nutrition. She currently serves as a professor of horticulture and deputy vice chancellor research, production, and extension at JQuat. In 2016, she released nine varieties of African indigenous vegetables, and in 2018, she was nominated as a fellow of the African Academy of Sciences. Join me in welcoming Professor Mary Abusa Onyango from JQuat. Hello, Professor. Hello, Esperanza. Thank you so much for joining us today. So during this live session, we are going to be discussing and reviewing how to eat healthy with African indigenous foods in our normal or rather say basic meal plans. And to start us off, we are going to play a short two minute video of a recipe book, an indigenous recipe book that was published by Interregion Economic Network. And this book is, in an, is an initiative to activate rural economies through the power of indigenous foods in Kenya. You are going, you are going to, to love, love Chakula Chetu Indigenous Recipe Book a detailed compilation of 17 indigenous recipes from the Lake region of Kenya. The main thing that I love most about this book is that the recipes take me back to the future by reminding me how to prepare traditional meals in my own modern kitchen. The book is a product of over three years working together with chefs and outside caterers in the Western Lake region of Kenya who carefully selected and prepare these recipes for your use. One recipe that interests me is the banana bread that is meant for people on the go, travelers, farmers, and ideal even for office coffee break. The Takula Chetu book recognizes the importance of good sceneries to good food. It offers the reader great carefully selected scenic pictures of sites from Lake region of Kenya. Each of the sceneries carries its own rich cultural story. Chakula Chetu not only shows you how to prepare great traditional meals, but also it activates development of rural economies where the local produce in form of ingredients originate from. So as you prepare that meal from the book, 
you have promoted a local producer back in the rural area. The recipe book inspires me to basic cooking and eating healthy. Chakula Chetu Indigenous Recipe Book really brings the Kenyan lake food culture together into your own modern kitchen. So, Professor, we'd like to hear your thoughts on the Chakula Chetu Recipe Book. I thank you very much. First and foremost, I want to congratulate your organization for coming up with this book, Chakula Chetu. In my endeavor in working with the indigenous foods, especially vegetables, one of the challenges has been uh, the lack of recipes because most of the young people or young population, especially in urban areas, do not know how to prepare the indigenous foods. So this book comes in handy among others that I have seen but why I like this book is because it's full of pictorial, a lot of pictures of the dishes that have been prepared. And then there's an indication also uh, of how to prepare in a very simple way. And it's very easy to follow. Anybody can use it at home or in a restaurant or in any place or even institution. Three, I would like to comment and say that uh, in each recipe, there is uh, an indication of the nutrient content of the dishes that have been developed, which is very important because depending on what your demand is, you can choose a recipe uh, depending on the nutrient content, which many of us don't look at because sometimes we choose food and we eat because of the palate but not because of the nutrient content. Uh, the other important thing I've seen is that there's a diversity of dishes, ranging from vegetables, root crops, grains, which is a good sample of what is there in uh, Western Kenya or Lake Victoria region, as you have indicated in the book. So it's a very good book that I will encourage all of us to have a look, access it where possible, and try those recipes in your own house or in your own setting. However, I would like to say that this book, as it is, is written in English. So one thing that I would like for improvement is to translate this book, if possible, in Kiswahili and maybe other languages, especially where the recipes were taken from. The other thing I would like to do is, like I've seen one of my colleagues uh, from Kenyatta University, Professor Kimiwe, also has done some recipes and has done actually nutrient content, not just indicating vitamin A and B, giving exact amounts of the nutrients that are there. And this will help to know how much of the food do you eat to get the, require, the required nutrients for the various nutrients of the body. Otherwise, I want to say that uh, it is a book that uh, will go a long way in helping Kenya and Africa to promote our own heritage, the foods that we are, we are supposed to be eating. We've been eating, our ancestors ate, but because of uh, many factors we'll discuss later, we see that we have not been uh, embracing these uh, foods. So this is one um, factor that will, will help all of us to prepare these foods in a way that we can enjoy it. And I like, maybe I say that, but I want to emphasize that the pictorial and the simplicity of the recipe is very overwhelming and very encouraging. Thank you. Thank you so much, Professor. And during the week, uh, starting last week, we've been receiving questions from you concerning eating healthy uh, with indigenous foods. So I will go straight to question one. What value do indigenous foods bring on our modern tables or menus? First and foremost, I want to say that the indigenous foods come in various categories. Uh, we have uh, vegetables. Uh, we also have uh, fruits, indigenous fruits. We have indigenous roots 
and also indigenous grains. So each one of these brings in uh, a contribution to the nutrition or diet of the people who consume them. Let me start with the vegetables and the fruits. Maybe this is my pet subject, and then I'll go to the other categories. Now, when you look at indigenous vegetables, especially African indigenous vegetables, they are nutrient dense, so to speak. Our research has shown that African indigenous vegetables, like African indigenous vegetables like managu, terere, and uh, kunde have a uh, relatively high contents of minerals and also vitamins and phytochemicals that help the body to remain healthy. And I want to add and say that our research has shown that most of these indigenous vegetables, the nutrient content is either equal to or better than some of the common vegetables that we consume like cabbage. Not to say that cabbage is bad, but we see that they have a competitive advantage. When you come to even grains, for example, like wimby or millet, millet is a grain just like maize. But if you look at millet as an indigenous grain, it has not only the starch which is expected, it also has minerals and other health benefits. Now, if it comes to a protein source, we have what we call bambara nuts. Now, bambara nuts is what we call a whole food. It has the starch, the protein, minerals, and it has been reported to have some health benefits. Uh, in terms of uh, making the body more strong and also boosting the immunity of the body. So in general terms, all the indigenous vegeta vegetables, fruits, grains, and uh, even uh, roots have a very good uh, nutrient content and also health benefits. Now, I want to add at this point is that so long as they are in their natural state, because once you modify a uh, vegetable or any crop, it changes many things, including uh, the nutrient content. Now, like the cabbage we eat at the moment, uh, that uh, they're on the market, they're the improved varieties. So you find that they are high yielding, but the original cabbage was very, very nutritious and with a lot of content. So you find when you do modification, improving the yields, if you don't breed for particular nutrients, you find that they are less in nutrients. So our natural foods, before they are modified, they're actually balanced. They may not be very high yielding, but they have a lot of nutrients. We call them nutrient dense crops. So those are the things that we have observed across all indigenous foods, especially so vegetables and fruits. Okay, next question. Can African indigenous cuisines meet the time demands of urbanized populations? Yeah, thank you very much. Uh, indigenous foods can actually be used in urban centers despite the busy schedule of uh, the urban population. But I want to add that uh, I will not excuse anybody not to eat indigenous food because of time, because health is of essence. First, you have to be healthy, eat well, before you can work. So it's important to invest time, even in preparing foods or having those foods in our tables almost every day in our houses. Nevertheless, there are other opportunities that you can use to be able to access these indigenous foods. First and foremost, we find out that uh, many of our restaurants are actually um, cooking these foods so if you cannot be able to go and cook in your house, you can go to a restaurant and access these indigenous foods. And uh, there are very good uh, restaurants. Just for example, if you look at Nairobi, there is uh, a restaurant that's called Ronalo. That one you go there, you find indigenous food. So if you cannot prepare the food yourself at home, you can access. Two, we have also takeaway foods that are being cooked in some supermarkets. For example, I know Tuskis has that um, service. So the busy people who claim they don't want to eat indigenous foods, they can take these foods. We also have other opportunities, pre-cooked food, 
pre prepared food. For example, you have the managu, for example, it is well plucked and it just prepared, ready to cook. So despite all the busy schedule and excuses we have, we have opportunities in urban areas to be able to access indigenous foods uh, through restaurants, pre-cooked uh, foods, or having somebody to, uh, to be able to prepare for you uh, so that you can consume them. So the opportunities are there. And despite our busy schedule, we can still access indigenous foods in various forms. So clearly, uh, uh, we should not have experience of busy schedules. We should be able to get these indigenous foods and actually consume them. Okay. Next question. Uh, in your articles, you mentioned it is not good to cook sukumawiki and sweet chad, in brackets, cabbage. Why is that? Thank you for that question. I want to maybe, before I answer the question directly, uh, fruits and vegetables, fruits and vegetables are best eaten raw. That's the best way. But some vegetables uh, can be cooked. But when you cook any vegetable or fruit, if you cook at all, you compromise on the nutrient content. Sometimes when you cook, the nutrient content reduces. For example, if you cook a vegetable, you reduce the vitamins. But in some cases, when you cook a vegetable, you find that the nutrient content, some of the nutrient content will go higher, for example, minerals. So in general terms, uh, when you have a crop or a food or a special vegetable, like the ones you have just mentioned in the question, you will need to know how do you cook it. But science has shown that actually uh, different ways of cooking will reduce the nutrient content of these foods. So we find that any cooking will reduce, but different cooking methods will reduce at different levels. For example, if you do what you call blanching, blanching is where you just dip this uh, vegetable in hot water one minute and put in cold water. This unlocks some of the nutrients and also preserves them. So blanching is one of the best ways to go about it if you must cook, then the steaming, uh, where you steam with the steam, not boiling, then there's boiling and there's frying and, and many others. So for vegetables, the shorter you cook, the better. That's the rule of thumb. And the, the, the more ingredients, if you add some ingredients, it complements what the vegetables have. So uh, what I would advise is that when you have your vegetables, try to cook them in a brief uh, minutes as possible so that you don't compromise, so you don't lose uh, the vitamins and other nutrients. At the same time, some vegetables, they are important for you to cook. For example, the tomatoes and some of the green vegetables, when you blanch them, as I said, they release some of the nutrients that are not available in the raw form. So it's a matter of balancing. But as I said earlier, fruits and vegetables are best eaten when they are raw. But cooking comes, necessitates, comes in when you need to unlock and also to preserve and to reduce some of the anti-nutrients that some of the indigenous vegetables have. So that's what I can say in relation to that question. Okay. What type of innovative approaches are required to enable indigenous foods meet time demands and changing palate, e.g. test bud preferences? Now, thank you very much for that question. I know many of us have, have had this uh, uh, attitude that indigenous vegetables are not yummy at all. But as we, as I will discuss the innovations, I want all of us to take them with caution because many of the vegetables, the simpler you cook, many of the vegetables and, and uh, foods that are of African origin, the simpler you cook, the better. And the aim is, apart from pleasing the palate, is to ensure there's maximum nutrient exploitation or uh, taking off the nutrients from the crops or from the plants or from the foods. So you find that some of the innovative ways I'm going to discuss, I will discuss and say they are not the best, but they are the ones we can use. For example, we find that some of the foods, like for example, Duma, you can make crisps out of them. Just, just the way you get potato crisps or not, so that the young people can eat. But I want to add a caution that we know that crisps you deep fry. When you deep fry, we are talking about healthy eating. So when you deep fry in Duma or 
you defry potatoes, you are compromising the nutrient content and you're not healthy eating as such. But people can use that to please the palate. But as you please the palate, please ensure that you do not compromise the nutrient content. So we have ways in which you can cook, for example, you can bake the, the you can do the baking, just let you bake other uh, exotic uh, vegetables or, uh, or foods. So in, in a nutshell, you can use all the ways like baking, frying, uh, and also uh, using all conventional methods that have been used in exotic foods to be able to, uh, to improve the palate. But do it with caution so that you don't compromise the nutrient content. That's my, 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 my take home message because we can have innovative ways of doing it, but then at the same time, we are compromising the nutrient content. So when you are using some of these new methods, you know, frying or as I said, uh, drying and so on, you are compromising on the uh, nutrient content. But there are very many, you can just do anything that you can do with the other conventional foods. You can do baking and frying and boiling and so on. Thank you. Next question. How do we then teach urban-based populations how to prepare indigenous foods? Thank you very much, Chesoni. Like what we are doing today, that's one of the best ways, one of the ways we can teach. For all those who are watching, they have seen the recipe book and they have seen uh, the, uh, the recipes that are there. So, and then what we are discussing now. So one of the ways are platforms like social media and other media platforms are best to use to educate the urban population on how to uh, cook and consume these indigenous foods. Other methods that we can use and which we have used is, uh, for example, uh, demonstration, cooking demonstrations uh, that we can do in various ways, even on TV. We have some, some programs on TV and even on, on radio to show how to cook these vegetables. We have advocacy, which we can use to advocate uh, even demonstration plots like the Ministry of uh, Agriculture and the Ministry of Health normally have uh, programs where they do demonstrations uh, for these vegetables and also indigenous foods on how to improve the cooking. The other way is holding festivals for indigenous foods. We've done this with the National Museums of Kenya for a long time, focusing on indigenous foods where we call different communities uh, they come to the center to Nairobi and we hold like a, a indigenous food festival so that uh, these people come and share their ideas. Sometimes we even tap into indigenous knowledge and then we also uh, have the research, researched methods of cooking and uh, some other advantages. So there are various ways we can use, especially the mass media. We can use demonstrations, festivals, and also capacity building. Uh, we can just teach different people at different levels. Even at, for example, at universities, uh, we have uh, programs that deal with nutrition like JKUAT. And we, we just ensure that the young people embrace these indigenous foods at all levels, either in the urban areas and also in the rural areas. Because with the internet and the, the technology, you can get this information at whatever level you are, especially focusing on urban population. Thank you. Thank there you. is a question on accessibility of the seeds. I wish to grow an acre of AIVs, the spider plant, managu, and spinach, and sweet potatoes. Where can I get good seeds and a guide of agronomic practices? Okay, thank you for that question. I'm happy that you want to grow indigenous uh, vegetables like managu. First and foremost, depending on where you are, there are various organizations that are you can access these uh, uh, seeds from. Uh, first, before I give you the list, I want to say that actually indigenous vegetables, especially managu, the seeds are not so available as other exotic vegetables like cabbage. But however, at the moment, I know Kenya Seed Company is actually selling some varieties of indigenous vegetables like managu and some of which we have mentioned. However, we can also access uh, quality seed from 
CALRO, uh, which is Kenya Agricultural Livestock uh, Research Organization. We have various uh, centers all over Kenya and other uh, research institutions like uh, Jomo Kenyatta, like in my university, you can access some of the seeds from there, especially for indigenous vegetables. You can get these uh, veg vegetable seeds uh, from also some NGOs like in Western Kenya. We have an NGO called Tatro in Western Kenya, in Nyanza province. So we have NGOs and partners we, are, we have all over Kenya that you can access quality seed. As I said, we are not there yet, but you can get most of these seeds from Kenya Seed Company, research organization, NGOs, and uh, also from other farmers. Next, what are the factors that influence our eating habits? Or rather, what are the barriers and facilitators to eating healthy in Kenya? Now, first and foremost, uh, to people how uh, people decide how to eat because of the, what they eat depend on the various factors. So one of the factors, the main one is your culture, your community, where you come from. Normally we come from different communities. For example, people from rural areas, they are used particular, a particular kind of uh, uh, diet. But when they come to, to the center, the urban centers, they change their consumption patterns. So it's your environment, your community. So you find people in urban areas will eat various uh, diets, even from different communities. But if you are from a particular area, you eat what you are able to eat that's available there too. The other factor is socioeconomic uh, factors. How cheap is the crop? How is the food? How cheap can you afford it? And then uh, the other factors are the palatability, the taste, like we talked about earlier, the palate. Some people just choose the food because it is delicious. Some use nutrient. Nutrient normally is not the first on the list. Normally it's uh, somewhere below. But normally some people choose because some certain foods because of the nutritious content. Some factors uh, that will determine the choice will also uh, include your health status. For example, uh, some patients who have diabetes are encouraged to eat certain foods, like uh, to eat the finger, mi finger millet uh, products because they are slow release of sugar in the body because uh, of diabetes. So some of the factors are those ones. And how do we now encourage people or how do we uh, ensure that people are eating these vegetables and these other crops that are indigenous? One and foremost, is to ensure that they are available, they are affordable. They also, people have knowledge on how to cook. They also know the benefits of, this, of these crops. And then there should be advocacy. We need to talk and to be proud of what we have. We need to capacity build everybody. Tell people, young people, these things are good. We tell the farmers, we tell the policymakers. So it's everybody has to play a part to know that our heritage, our great great grandfathers ate these things and they stayed for a long time. So we should not just embrace the exotic foods. They are good. And just try it by yourself, by trying and see how you feel when you eat them and cook them in a natural way, not using ways in which that will affect your health. You have mentioned a lot on the nutritional benefits. So the next question, what is known mm. about the priority nutrition benefits of these indigenous foods and how can this knowledge be incorporated into disease prevention strategies? Thank you very much. The selling point of most of indigenous foods, especially vegetables, is the nutritional and health benefits. First, we find that uh, when we start with the different groups, each one of them, as I said earlier, have a competitive advantage in terms of nutrition and also health benefits. For example, if you look at uh, vegetables and fruits, they have high content of micronutrients. They have a high content of vitamins and minerals, which are very key for optimal development. These vegetables and fruits have what we call 
phytochemicals. Phytochemicals are those chemicals you find in fruits and vegetables that are able to boost your immunity, first of all, and two, to cleanse your system so that you are not predisposed to some of the lifestyle diseases. So you find that the vegetables and fruits, especially the indigenous ones, because we have compared the vitamin and mineral content of fruits and vegetables for the indigenous ones and the exotic ones, we find that the African indigenous vegetables and fruits have a high content of the phytochemicals and also the minerals and health benef ben benefiting content. So you find that uh, for us to exploit these vegetables and fruits, we must include them in health and nutrition intervention programs because if you are healthy, you eat well, you eat what we are now calling protective foods, fruits and vegetables, your immune is strong, then you are less predisposed. So we are talking about prevention of diseases. We don't have to wait until we are sick. The great philosopher Hippocrates said, let food be your medicine. So we do not have to wait to be sick. So if you eat right, the way naturally as it was intended to be before we started uh, adulterating these foods, you are supposed to be healthy. So you eat balanced diet, you eat a lot of protective foods and less of the bad fat. Of course, we have some good fat. So if you eat well, uh, which you can find, eat well, eat well and get the nutrient content that will give your body optimal nutrients and optimal immunity, then that means that we can be talking about prevention of diseases. Then even if you get the disease, eating the protective food will help you even recover. So these foods actually should be embedded into nutritional and health programs, disease prevention and even recovery in all aspects. When you look at other uh, foods, for example, if you look at um, millet and bambara nut I talked about earlier, research has shown that bambara nut has cancer prevention uh, properties. It has some phytochemicals in it. So you find that all this research, instead of giving somebody medicine before they fall sick, you prevent that disease by giving them the right indigenous food, depending on the scientific evidence of what they contain. And that will reduce even the cost of disease prevention. So in an endeavor to exploit the indigenous foods, we must look at what they have and incorporate them as we talk about disease prevention and also as we talk about healthy nation. Maybe just to expound a little bit, you've talked about bambara nuts and how they can prevent some cancerous uh, growing. Which other uh, African indigenous vegetable can you expound on, on their health benefits in particular? Uh, as I said earlier, most of the indigenous vegetables also have health benefits. For example, uh, let me start with the very bitter ones because many people don't want like bitter things. So we have mito. We have managu, which have bitter, bitterness. Now that bitterness has a medicinal value according to indigenous knowledge and some scientific research has been done. And also we have African kale, which also has what we call uh, glucosinolase. So the compounds in this vegetable, for example, the ones I've given, will play a part. For example, glucosinolase are anti-cancer. Glucosinolase are compounds you find in African kale not the uh, sukuma week you know this african kale normally called kanzira in some dialects so it has that one and then two we find that amanagu has phenolic compounds and also mito which helps also in the uh, treatment or it helps in uh, diseases like stomach cancers or stomach related ailments mito which is bitter also mito is we call slender leaf is also useful in uh, uh, malaria, 
the roots and the, the leaves. So those are some of the examples. Of course, a, lo a lot of work is being done now with the, uh, with the interest in African foods. We find that people are now getting into even the medical uh, field is going into the expounding, to putting actually facts and evidence to it. And the little research that has been done, it shows, sure enough, this indigenous knowledge showing that indigenous vegetables are medicinal is being confirmed. So those are some of the examples. Thank you so much. Next question. Are the indigenous farmer markets addressing healthy eating initiatives? And if not, how can they be involved? Now, indigenous farmer markets, are they addressing the health benefits? Now, uh, indigenous farmer markets, first of all, the fact that these farmers, the answer is yes and no, but mostly yes. And the reasoning is this. Because these farmers are already growing these vegetables or these crops, it's already showing that they are involved, they are concerned about healthy eating. And most of these farmers who are growing these indigenous foods, most of them are growing them organically. And we know at the moment that everybody's looking for organic foods. Although it may not be in a structured way, but at the back of their mind, from their indigenous knowledge and from their maybe what they have learned from each other, they are aware that these indigenous foods are very important. So they are actually informally involved in health eating by producing indigenous foods. However, this can be improved. This can be improved by uh, the government through various ministries like health ministry and the Ministry of Agriculture, county governments. We can now, now put together these farmers who are producing these uh, 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 vegetables and uh, other indigenous foods to give them information, to sensitize them so that when they produce these uh, indigenous foods, they should also consider and know that actually there's an ideal way of doing it, organically growing them and knowing that what they are producing is safe to eat. So it's a matter of just strengthening them. But in my opinion, I think they're already involved. They may not be aware, but the fact that they are actually doing it, producing and supplying to the people is just, they are in it. But we need now to streamline, maybe through the various organs of government, NGOs, and other participants, stakeholders interested in health eating. And I think uh, the, the, we can have this room for improvement. Thank you. Sorry, we had a glitch there on internet, but you're back on. Uh, next question, Professor, you have tackled uh, on affordability. And so there's a question saying, how affordable are the indigenous foods to a normal household? Giving an example of urban versus rural. Uh, first and foremost, I want to say that uh, indigenous foods uh, have been promoted in the last few years through various uh, channels and people are becoming conscious on uh, the consumption of these uh, indigenous foods. Now, uh, because of uh, that, we find that uh, the demand is growing, but the, con the demand cannot be met as we speak at this moment. Although there has been an increased consumption of the indigenous foods, uh, generally speaking, we find that uh, more of the indigenous foods is eaten in the rural areas, but less in the urban areas. But when it comes to affordability, uh, we find that in urban areas, these foods are very expensive. In fact, I must say that uh, most of the rural poor cannot afford actually the indigenous foods, especially in restaurants and also in markets, they are very expensive. But you find in rural areas, they are relatively cheaper because they are growing them. People are growing them on their farms and uh, this reduces the cost of it. But when you go to a market, you find they are very expensive. I'll keep giving example. For example, if you go and buy Wimby, Wimby is a, a finger millet in a market, in an urban market, and you want to buy enough for your family compared to maize or other starches or even bread, you find the Wimby is very expensive. The reason is because there is no adequate, there's no enough supply to meet the demands of the people at the moment. 
when it comes to the vegetables, there have been an increase in production over the years. When you look at the statistics from 2011, 2014 up to now, there's been an increase on vegetable production, indigenous vegetable production. But the demand is too, still too high. For example, where we have the supermarket selling these vegetables, when they go to the market or when they go to the supermarket, sometimes if you go late, you find that they are finished. So what we are saying is that there is room for improvement. There is, they are expensive, but they are not uh, available uh, to all people. And also the production has to be improved. And also we are saying that uh, in urban areas, more expensive than in rural areas. So that means the, there's actually an opportunity to link the rural farmers who are growing these African indigenous vegetables to the up urban markets in, let's say, Nairobi. Yes, thank you. Uh, it's not just uh, there's an opportunity, but we've been doing it. We have uh, uh, farmers who actually, with the technology we have, there are farmers who can actually supply vegetables from areas uh, like Kisi, and they put on a bus those vegetables. They come to Nairobi, they give someone receives them and then they send the money so that is being done but it needs to be improved the marketing system so if you can link the farmers to the suppliers to the to the traders in nairobi that would be go a, lo a long way it's being done but i think it needs to be improved because what i want to emphasize is that we don't want to have these vegetables when they are grown and marketed and not, not to to benefit only the middlemen would like to have the farmers themselves also benefiting because most of these vegetables for example are actually uh, grown by uh, the youth and women so sometimes when the middlemen come in they exploit the grower so what we've done in some of the projects or some of the, our interventions is to link the farmers uh, from rural areas to traders in Nairobi they have their own arrangement and this actually is a booming business especially when you, we look at indigenous vegetables from kisi from western kenya from kakamega from viga to nairobi so they have links like that so it's an area that you can exploit so that you get fresh vegetables and nutritious vegetables at an affordable price thank you uh, what are the patterns of indigenous food intake in kenya and the contribution of these foods to the total nutrient intake now, I want to start by saying that the pattern of consumption of indigenous foods varies with community, varies with age, varies with the economic status, and many other factors. But in general terms, we find that, uh, from my observation, the studies we have seen, we find indigenous vegetables consumption indigenous foods consumption has not reached an optimal level the consumption of indigenous foods has increased over time maybe over the last 10 years but there's still room for improvement there is still need for more people to eat indigenous foods so uh because of these factors we find in urban areas Many people actually <clears throat> are learning to eat some foods that don't come from their own communities. So we need to focus on how to improve, on how to improve production so that these foods are obtainable by all people in rural urban areas. With regard to their contribution to the nutrient contents the nutrient <clears throat> the nutrition of the people in Kenya we are not there yet they are contributing but not up sub optimal to less optimal level because uh, uh, not everybody can access this food but more can be done we need to ensure that these foods the nutritious indigenous foods are grown we have adequate supplies and also people can afford them so we are in both areas consumption varies with the area you come from your age your preferences but as far as the contribution of indigenous foods we are still in suboptimal levels so we can still do more 
to ensure these foods are available to everybody so that they can exploit the advantages of these foods. The second last question, what is the link between traditional African diets with low incidences of chronic degenerative diseases? Uh, thank you very much for that question. African indigenous diets or African indigenous foods will be useful in terms of uh, health and uh, nutri nutritional health status of, of people or the population, depending on how to, you produce them and how you cook them. So if you produce them organically, you cook them in the best way, not the way I describe, where you fry and put in other uh, unhealthy uh, practices or methods. If you do it the, the, the traditional way, I would say, although there's no official study that I have done, but from my observation and from the fact that we know that these foods are nutritious, there's a, uh, a link. The more you eat, the less you are predisposed to this, some of these diseases, especially uh, lifestyle diseases and also micronutrient deficiency diseases, the hidden hunger. So there is a link uh, from the fact that most of these indigenous foods are very nutritious. And of course, as I said earlier, let food be your medicine. This was said by a philosopher who, one of the people who, who discovered modern medicine. So if you eat well, you don't need to, to, be, to be treated or you need, don't need to be sick. So if you eat these veg this vegetables and fruits and grains and duma uh, uh, and the rest, you eat them in the proper way, not crisps, not fried, and boiled properly, it, grown organically, then you are less disposed to any disease. Your immune is boosted, and then you find that you can be able to withstand many diseases. So I would say that eating these vegetables is negatively linked to incidence of some diseases, especially lifestyle, lifestyle diseases and diseases that are, deal with the immune system. Of course, immune system means if you are, your immune system is higher, you are less uh, sickly and uh, predisposed to diseases. Thank you so much. What role should our government play in promoting indigenous foods in Kenya? Thank you for that question. First of all, maybe the question should be, what is the government doing? Already actually government is doing a lot of work, a lot of uh, intervention and strategies to promote indigenous foods. And this is actually is supported by some of the policies in place. For example, we have the food and nutrition security policy that came in place in 2012. And this is also helping and emphasizing on uh, indigenous foods. We have the vision 2030, which wants to improve the quality of life of all Kenyans. And in one of the sections, when we look at the food production, there's an emphasis on uh, uh, exploiting indigenous foods. So uh, first of all, the policies are in place. Then as we speak now, the Minister of Agriculture is now linking up the Minister of Health and they have been organizing what we call agri-nutrition uh, conferences. So there is a way that we are trying to link, the government is trying to link agriculture and nutrition. Before what used to happen is that the Minister of Agriculture used to work on its own and then health on its own. So there's that collaboration, the government's coordinating collaboration so that we can exploit these indigenous foods by linking uh, agriculture and nutrition. And then there's also what we call programs like uh, nutrition sensitive agriculture. So you're not just growing food to fill the stomach, you are growing food to be able to ensure you get nutritional uh, benefits of all the foods. The other way the government is doing and can also re uh, reinforce is capacity building. Capacity building at all levels. Capacity building at universities, at agricultural institutions, capacity building uh, even for policy makers and also capacity building for farmers, traders and all of them. So this is supposed to be streamlining. If there can be a systematic way the government can streamline African indigenous foods in all our aspects, in our schools, in our universities, 
in our hospitals, in our institutions, so that when a doctor is recommending food, if you are unwell, he's not telling you to go and eat carrot. He's going to tell you go and eat one of the indigenous foods. So that is uh, being done, but it should be reinforced. Apart from capacity building, advocacy has been going on and it should be reinforced. Advocacy of our foods, of our heritage, by also strengthening, strengthening institutions to be able to bring up a strong liking and a strong uh, positive attitude on the people, on these uh, crops or on these foods. Advocacy, 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 all starts with attitude, starting from the farmer to the consumer, to everybody, to the policy maker, so that we are all uh, guided by the government on what to, 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 to produce. For example, when you talk about food security, we should not just be talking about maize. When the government talks about food security, we, sh we should have a mainstream where actually these other foods are put in. You should be talking about millet, you should be talking about nduma, you should be talking about uh, sweet potatoes, you should be talking about indigenous vegetables, because we talk about food security, it's not just about maize. So that's one of the areas they can improve. improve. Others, I want to say that they have done a lot, I've worked a lot with the government, especially means of agriculture, Ministry of Health, they are doing a lot. There are, they are, they are actually strategies in place where and there are uh, action plans where they are trying to improve indigenous food foods uh, across the country and also county governments. We also work with them, with the various stakeholders. So the government is doing something, but more can be done so that when we come to the table in big hotels, in big restaurants in Kenya, when foreigners come, they should find all these indigenous foods there. There should be a policy that you have a restaurant, uh, big hotels, the government should say you should at least see a particular percentage of the food is indigenous so that we promote them. Another aspect that the government is doing is the blending. For example, when you have the maize uh, flour production, the government has actually encouraged and uh, has put in guide guidelines so that uh, you produce this uh, flour or products, uh, a percentage of it must be from the local foods. So they are doing something, they are doing a lot, but we are not there yet. So I want to uh, applaud the government of Kenya through the Ministry of Agriculture, Ministry of Health, the ones I've worked with and other ministries, they are doing a lot, county governments, so that we, wherever we are, we should be able to identify what is your our strong, indigenous foods for example if you go to Vika county what is there that you can sell to Kilifi county what is there in mombasa county that you can sell to kiambu county so that now it's not about this food is only for people from central or from coast or from western so it comes a national uh, a national heritage so that we are exploiting all this so government both national and uh, and uh, county governments have a lot to do and we people as researchers also, we are ready to come in, and I'm happy to say that, for example, CALRO, CALRO is the Kenya Agricultural Livestock Research Organization. We work with them a lot. They have prioritized research on indigenous foods. We have worked with them when they are doing their priority. Before, they used just to prioritize in uh, exotic crops. But now, since 2010, we've worked with them, and you find now there's a lot of research going on on indigenous uh, food crops. I want also to applaud the government for funding research, National Research Fund, they have been a beneficiary. They have given me some funds on African indigenous foods, especially vegetables, and many people are actually getting funds. So it's something we are doing and we, I think we are on the right track. And I think part of this initiative, like what we are doing now, advocates at all levels, on online advocacy, in whatever opportunity you have, we need to talk about these vegetables, support the government, because it's not about the government. The government, we are the government, because we should always know, what can I do to help the government? So as the government does its initiative, us as Wanainji, as researchers, wherever you sit, each one of us will have a part to play. And I want to say that uh, if all of us played this, our part, we will not be having issues of food security in Kenya or in Africa. And I want to say that one of the big four agenda of the government is food security and nutrition. And I know they are putting a lot of effort in mainstreaming indigenous 
uh, foods. So I want to say that let all of us do our part to be able to promote the indigenous foods. And I want to, uh, to ap appreciate all my colleagues who also gave me ideas of when I was coming to this talk. Uh, there are professors, there are people from the ministry whom I talked to, people from uh, uh, other universities and nutritionists and also uh, NGOs. I want to appreciate what they are doing because this work all of us are doing and all of us shall win and make sure Africa is food secure and is full of people who are energetic, strong and healthy. Thank you so much, Professor. So there you go, guys. Let your food be your medicine. And recently we celebrated the World Food Safety Day. And on that day, we were reminded that it, it is everyone's business to promote food safety, food safety and food security. So what you eat determines how, you, how your quality of life will be. Thank you so much, Professor, for joining us today. Thank you so much for the great insights. And thank you to everyone who joined us prior by sending in their questions. And thank you, everyone, for who has joined us today for the live session. Guys, click the share button so that your friends, your networks can be able to also gain from this great initiative. Promote your local producers by going to those markets. Don't just pass by those leafy vegetables that you see and ask yourself, what are those? How can, how can I prepare them? No, go there today, stop, buy, even if it's a bunch or two, go and prepare that indigenous vegetable so that you can promote your health. Remember, we've been told what you eat is your own medicine. So thank you, guys. Uh, lastly, remember to follow our Facebook page, our Twitter page, our Instagram at Iron Growth Pad for more of these uh, great insights on African indigenous vegetables. And also check your screen down there. There's a link where you can get the Chakula Tetu indigenous recipe book. This recipe book is going to inspire you and show you how you're going to prepare those African indigenous vegetables. Thank you so much, Professor, and thank you, everyone. See you in the next session. Bye. Stay safe and have a great weekend. Thank you. Thank you.